Cohen. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for making time to be here. I'm going to try to put it on. Yeah, OK. Uh, so um, as advertised, I, first of all, I really appreciate Ben, the invitation. And I think there is so much happening in the, in the, uh, in the field now that we really need to talk together. So the, the, my talk concerns integration of new resources, modeling, simulations and control with objectives, ultimate objectives to arrive at a framework that helps reliable and efficient operations in these changing systems. So it sounds like a very big complex set of questions and but we know that answers are needed given different, um, you know, different the actual situation in the industry and the needs to integrate uh, new resources. So the ultimate goal is to propose transparent minimal information exchange to support standards and protocols in the changing industry so that, uh, so that uh, things work. And once we understand that the first principles based on which these standards can uh, be derived, it becomes possible to assess operating problems that may happen if, you, uh, if uh, control is not designed right or we don't have enough communications and so forth. And um, so, so that is basically the idea. And I have organized the talk into several things here. Uh, I'm not going to go through them, but I want to emphasize first the structure preserving modeling for managing complex, complex systems with where you have multiple administrative entities. This is really the problem that underlies a lot of uh, things that we worry about uh, because um, the, some of the conventional modeling in which everybody shares the information and uh, things are centralized no longer hold. And I'm going to uh, give an example, quick example of how one can use this structure preserving modeling for small signal coordinated frequency stabilization and regulation. It actually turns out that um, it's a sort of natural outgrowth from those. And then, um, so this original structure preserving model was done under linearization assumptions for frequency stabilization only. Uh, but we have recently worked at MIT and before that at CMU on these uh, generalized uh, multi-layered energy modeling, which basically is also structure preserving, but instead of just emphasizing the role of real power, also the key role of reactive power and voltage deviations uh, is, uh, is taken into consideration. And I'll show some of the results, recent results that we've been working on. And then once we have this structure modeling, then I want to talk just very little about how one can uh, design control, not just for small signal stability, but also the, uh, to manage the system, like for both drive through through extreme conditions, uh, when you have in microgrids, when you have You are muted. I was muted all the way. Was I? No, muted? just for the, for the last 30 seconds, Maria. I don't know why it got that, I'm sorry. So can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, basically, once we understand this multi-layered energy modeling, I want to discuss how one can design the, in particular, primary control for fast dynamics, so that uh, we can manage voltage drive through and difficult conditions in um, when we have intermittent resources. And based on all of that, I would like to end up um, showing that and uh, sort of suggesting that if we just extend generalize our ACE as the basis for reliable and efficient emerging system, uh, efficient systems we have now for frequency control, if we just generalize it according to these uh, concepts in uh, multi-layered energy modeling, then we actually can manage these intermittent resources and completely different architectures the way we haven't done that before. So, uh, just to start with, as you know, the, the, my main concern for me is control design. And again, there are different uh, system enhancements needs that are needed in today's hierarchical control and tertiary level. I'm not going to spell them out here. At the secondary level also, uh, we have problems with validating sometimes the models that we use. And uh, the part that I'm going to concentrate on is really how 
when the commands come from tertiary and secondary level to uh, generate power or to control power at the right rate of uh, change of power and maintain voltage and frequency within the operating limits, how one can actually design those controllers and automation. That's where a lot of new technologies come in. This is actually not the way um, the primary control works today. So to start with, just to address this complexity uh, from the very beginning, uh, I want to point out actually Dave Hill was the person who first started structure preserving modeling of power system dynamics. And uh, I had uh, some work with some students recently that we, we actually showed that you can use, there is a lot of structure basically, if you look at the model, if you, here you have two area system, small system, you know, conventional generation, two areas, and then solar plant. So uh, you can model, components in a very structured way. You can model the areas in very structured way and their interactions. And once you understand that structure, you understand what information needs to be exchanged between different layers, then uh, one can do a lot of distributed, interactive, scalable uh, assessment of conditions, monitoring, sensing, control, and so forth. So the basic uh, idea behind the structure preserving is that, let me show you on this, it's an easier example, just at the component level. Um, if you, everybody's familiar with the generator. So the generator basically has these internal states whose dynamics depends on its own states, its own automation, and also depends on the external interaction on the power with the rest of the system. Once that is understood, one can think about structure preserving model for the generator as being what we call intelligent balancing authority. Component can be very intelligent, manage itself in the interaction with uh, the rest of electric power system uh, by uh, exchanging this information uh, with the rest of the system. And I will build on that. So we understand that well in generators, in power plants, but recently, and I'll explain a little bit that in the in the talk that you can actually take any black box and think about component or subsystems or region as, um, as one black box that interacts with the rest of the world and it has knowledge about its own states, can control its own uh, things internally. And there is only so much because of this structure preserving characteristic that we have in the system that um, so much that needs to be exchanged to understand and capture interaction dynamics, oscillations, control them, and so forth. So all these uh, concepts are based on the very well-developed knowledge in large-scale dynamical systems, in particular by Professor Shiljak, uh, who's, run, uh, who's written really seminal books on how you can look, think about large-scale dynamical systems and characterize their stability, uh, having their local uh, characterization just in terms of their own variables, and then uh, creating this uh, Lyapunov function based uh, matrix, which reflects how strong are the effects of interactions with, others, with other components relative to your own eigenvalues, minimum and minimum, maximum eigenvalue. That's sort of simplified way of thinking about the idea. So the to do small signal stability analysis, you have to ensure first that your subsystem is stable and then check yeah, this condition to see if the effects of interactions are not stronger so that they, uh, so they could destabilize the, your stable subsystem. If that is a sufficient condition for stability, but the entire large scale dynamical systems are based on these concepts in, in uh, many applications and uh, people have worked on that in power systems as well. What that does for us now in this new world is basically uh, leads us to understanding that we can have multi-layered interactive communication infra uh, infrastructures in which you can even think about entire inter-regional setting, having many regions interacting, regions having uh, uh, different balancing authorities, balancing authority co comprising different distribution companies and so forth. And uh, it becomes possible for each of these entities to check its own stability, to ensure its own stability, and to check how strongly it is connected with the others so that it doesn't get destabilized. 
And so it becomes autonomous and uh, a lot can be done there. So this is the basis for uh, thinking about the system rather than one completely centralized in which one, let's say in this, uh, in this case, uh, interregional level, which is like Eastern interconnection would have to know everything about even, you know, small distribution systems down in, inside the, the, the regions and balancing authorities. It just has to, uh, these, these conditions for at least for linear, for small signal stability, they actually define sufficient conditions so that entities can check with higher up coordinating entities or among themselves, how strongly they are connected and um, are they going to destabilize each other. So I have a little example here, um, just very quickly. It is uh, two areas and every generator is unstable if you had negative damping. And it also, there is a strong coupling between uh, the two generators across control area. The question is, is this thing small signal frequency stable? And it's very easy to claim that, you know, you cannot say anything unless you make sure that components are stable and then they don't interact in stronger way than um, described by, by these uh, inequalities. So um, this now leads to the generalization that we are familiar with in AGC, but they now extend to frequency stabilization and regulation even in continuous domain with intermittent resources. So if you simulate um, using those formulas, which recognize the structure, if you simulate dynamics of generators themselves into areas and then go and define the inter-area inter variable, inter-area, uh, interaction variable is basically think about it as a net imbalance resulting from deviations in generation and deviations in load from schedules in one area. So it's direct extension of area control error, but um, it goes into continuous domain, doesn't have to be static concept. And uh, so this was introduced at MIT in early 90s. And there are a lot of nice things here to see that generators can oscillate internally at their own inertia, but across the areas, they interact to this inter-area interaction variable. And that interaction variable has unbelievable structure. It is constant when the subsystems are disconnected. And also it can be shown that is a function only of its own internal states and rates of change of internal states. So everybody can compute this interaction variable, exchange the information about uh, uh, with the neighbors and check conditions for feasibility and, and so forth. Um, so we have done over the years quite a bit, um, different students have done. Here is Kevin Bachovdin who simulated San Miguel Island, 2000 nodes and said there is two areas here and he, uh, he uh, derived using these formulas, that these multi-layered uh, formulas with interaction variables to show that area one interacts with area two uh, before there is any control in such a way that there is imbalance in area one. If this is continuous imbalance, it's not like AGC, but area two doesn't have any imbalance. Now one can control, area one can control itself so that it um, compensates has supplementary control to, <coughs> to cancel those interactions that those imbalances that it makes and uh, go back to zero, uh, zero interaction with the other area. This is how AGC works in, uh, in, a, um, in slower time scale, but here we have the generalization in continuous time domain. Uh, so uh, this now, becomes quite interesting when we have these intermittent resources when a lot of people are working on coordinated frequency control with intermittent disturbances, really working hard in frequency domain to see which low frequency oscillation may happen and so forth. What we are saying here is that uh, here you have the excitation fluctuation, which is deviation in load three because you have solar and it's persistent oscillation. This is what we typically see with, uh, with inter intermittent resources. And consequence can be that frequency of generator one, for example, can go unstable, 
or uh, free, uh, on the slower time scale, the frequency of slower frequency oscillations may be outside of ACE C1 or CPS1 reliability criteria. So this is a big problem and a lot of people are studying now with intermittent resources. The point that I'm trying to make is that this is actually quite manageable and one can develop very quickly algorithms for each area to watch itself and to make sure that there are no instabilities. Uh, however, there are surprises. Some surprises here are that um, you can have in that two area thing, you can have unstable system dynamics caused by small inertia of one component and weak transmission lines. So the lines are not overwhelming, but you have unstable component. And then you look uh, who is causing what, and you see oscillations in frequency, you have oscillations in tie line flows. And that all you can conclude by just looking at the properties of this matrix, uh, stability matrix, which just requires information about interfaces. And then you can design the controller so that you get rid of and each area can design the controllers to get rid of those inter area oscillations. So it's quite powerful and scalable. Then uh, the completely different thing if you have uh, negative damping on one component, but you have small impedance lines. And that means uh, that these are strongly connected and there you have completely different phenomena. I want to point out that in time domain that I'm modeling these things, this is much easier to understand than in the frequency domain. Imagine doing Fourier transformation and having all sorts of different frequency things. People are working a lot in frequency domain. The, what I'm presenting today is actually time domain uh, from uh, dynamical systems. And to show that if you take that path from large scale dynamical systems, you can say quite a bit about stability with these intermittent resources. And equally, uh, you can say something about uh, quality of surface frequency using these interaction variables and each control center can. This is interesting because you can have enhanced automatic generation control. One area can have high drop, but no disturbances. The other area can have wind and uh, has to buy storage to compensate itself in response to these wind disturbances. The idea is here that you can have cooperative exchange. So what used to be known as dynamic uh, AGC, that control areas help each other. Right now, that's not the case. And there is a lot of inefficiency because everybody is either riding on the other uh, entity or not helping each other. Uh, so, so just uh, to show here that these um, interaction variables, uh, which are basically net imbalances associated with any black box, can carry you a long way in understanding who is causing the instability and how to control it. So, uh, so that was on uh, small frequency analysis. Uh, and uh, most, more recently, I don't know why this thing actually happened. There is some scratching here. The, uh, in the more um, recent systems where you have bulk transmission systems connected uh, and the loads connected to microgrids like Sharif microgrid, Banshi microgrid, these are the test systems for control on typical distribution feeders with microgrid with many different resources. Um, there, people have studied and observed voltage oscillations also, not just uh, frequency oscillations. And um, to understand what's happening there, you can pursue exactly the same thing. It doesn't matter if this is, uh, if this is PV or it's a conventional generator. You think about that as black box with its structure, which interacts with the rest of the system. And uh, the, the point here is that because we have a lot of solar power electronically, uh, uh, controlled solar and we have storage and there are often voltage oscillations. Because of that, now we have to generalize this modeling, which wasn't there before. So we are introducing this energy-based dynamical model as follows. So you have the electric grid and then you have generators, conventional generators, inverters. And um, in order to see if the system can work together, it's a new system you have to um, first 
say something if energy is going to balance over a longer period of time. So you have energy as a state variable. Then when you interconnect them, they have to also have power balancing. So that basis for power as an interface variable. But in this energy space, we also introduced something which is really tricky and relevant. If we don't capture it in intermittent, in the new, uh, new systems, we cannot differentiate between the fast and slow technology. So you can have fast varying generation intermittent radiance here of the solar and slow varying load profile. And you are trying to balance them. Because of that, it's very important to understand that there are going to be these low frequency, low voltage, even electromagnetic oscillations between different components, which are power electronically controlled, if the rates at which power uh, uh, balances are not uh, met. So the rates become very, very big issue in, in the new industry. So this is the basis for rate of change of reactive power. So we now have done over the years quite a bit of mathematical derivations for time varying phasor models first, then for models which are not even sinusoidal, um, uh, completely transient behavior in which we can show that you, instead of characterizing black box in terms of just power interaction with the rest of the world, you have to have this triplet. And if you do that and start thinking about the interconnected system or candidate architecture as a, as a possible architecture interconnecting these pieces of puzzle, then you can get somewhere. So this unified energy-based modeling, and I've left a lot of references here, and I'm not going uh, to go through to the math in detail, but just to give you the basic idea, each black box, black box can be thought of having stored energy and how much stored energy is in the box will depend on how much power, net power comes in minus thermal losses. This is your first conservation of power. Um, the second is very new, and this is what we've been working on now for several years. If you take second derivative of stored energy in the box, you can show that that second derivative of stored energy will contribute to real work. This is the first term, but not all of that will go into work. There will be rate of change of reactive power that is a waste. And um, so what we are not doing now in these new systems, we are not balancing this rate of change of reactive power in the interfaces. We are just observing uh, first conservation law. So uh, what we've been doing, and I want to explain these on the examples as we go here, um, think about these as basically inverter controlled volt DC source or AC source, voltage source supplying power load. That is uh, two subsystems, two components, two black boxes. And the question is now, uh, how, what can I say about stability? How can I control this system? How can I supply power? If you remember, when you try to supply power, you have negative impedance, incremental impedance, and that makes everything unstable and so forth. So uh, I'll go through that in a minute. The first thing I just made this, um, this week, basically to illustrate that doesn't matter which single component port to port system we have in these evolving systems, we can always think in terms of having stored energy in the box, some source of energy, which is the control internally and some energy conversion. So it becomes very unifying. We don't have to just say this is virtual swing equation of the inverter. We don't have to do that. We just use this uh, stored energy dynamics, which is universal. And then on the interfaces, you get this generalized interaction variable. If you remember, the first interaction variable was the um, rate of change of interaction variable when we didn't worry about reactive power, was just power. Uh, but now we have rate of change of reactive power is rate of change of second component in the interaction variable. And it's, um, it has both power, rate of change of interaction variable when you account for voltage and reactive power changes has two components. One is instantaneous power and the other one is rate of change of instantaneous reactive power. Don't have time to go through this, but there is a paper by John Wyatt and myself from 90s, which defines this 
rate of reactive power, which is not just for time bearing phasers. So we are working in time domain. We don't have to have a frequency analysis and so forth. So what was fascinating, and we just learned about this maybe two years ago, Rupamati Jadivada was the instrumental. She did a PhD, she did a PhD thesis on this, on revisiting dynamics of reactive power for the changing in the uh, systems. And uh, we found out that even when you add these electromagnetic phenomena, rate of change of reactive power to the interaction between the box and the rest of the system, you're always going to have, still have the same structural property that that interaction variable remi remains constant when the component is disconnected from the rest of the world. And this took some doing, but we, uh, one can show that interaction variable is a function of its own state and rate of change of its state. So everything generalizes, doesn't matter if it's electromagnetic or mechanical. And uh, once you understand that structure, then we can actually uh, rethink the dynamics, as, as I said, as interacting black boxes and, uh, and establish uh, protocols for the changing industry in, in which not everybody has to know everything. Just to point out here, again, not much time, but that there is a key role of rate of change of Q, in particular in non-sinusoidal systems. We have spent a lot of time, uh, even with some uh, small tactical microgrid systems and so forth, where you have uh, the question is, how do you define um, these very fast time scale oscillations, for example, you want to go from DC to AC if you are inverter-based ba uh, resource, but you implement that using PWM. So PWM switching is high frequency, it almost behaves like a noise. So if you go by definition of this time-bearing reactive power, and first you simulate um, that uh, voltage-controlled uh, filter that I showed you, just um, assuming a sinusoidal waveform, you get nice sinusoidal waveform. But if you actually now superpose PWM switching on top of it, you're going to have all these oscillations. So it's zoomed in oscillations, zoomed out oscillations, but we see all this all the time in, um, in PWM controlled uh, circuits and we actually don't know what's going on. So it, it, this the conjecture here is that um, those oscillations are directly consequence of really not balancing uh, rate of change of reactive power, when in particular in non-sinusoidal systems. Okay, so once we understand that we can think about every box now that way as having its own stored energy, a rate of change of stored energy, and interaction in terms of power, rate of change of reactive power with the rest of the world, now we can begin to build similar models that we had in the linearized models for frequency that people use in uh, under decoupling of real power assumptions, the first one that I showed you. And uh, how does that go? Let's go back to this, this circuit. Now, this is inverter controlled voltage source. It's supplying another component. So I think about them as two black boxes these two black boxes interact. There is this, that's all what it is that the neighbor needs to know, stored energy and rate of change of stored energy, sorry, to model the component models itself at the aggregate level, just uh, using stored energy and rate of change of stored energy. But then um, interaction with the other, uh, other component, with the load that it needs to serve is rate of change of the interaction variable. In this case, is power, uh, integral of power out from the first component and reactive power out of the first component to the second component. And the same thing happens from the second component. Second component has its own dynamics in terms of its stored energy, energy conversion, whatever energy conversion is. And we know now using generalized Telegan's theorem, Ruba had a nice result here, which it shows that uh, it, uh, reactive power, rate of change of reactive power in time domain for non-sinusoidal signals actually um, obeys generalized Telegan's theorem. 
for people who are familiar with this, and I think I saw Seth Sanders here, is that uh, Paul Penfield in his seminal book on Telegance Theorem never, never says that reactive power balances. He's shied away from that. Uh, so you can actually not show for arbitrary signals that reactive power balances because you have this stored energy and oscillates for a while. And what we are doing with energy control, we are actually designing the control so that rate of change of reactive power balances, and then you don't have inter, um, inter area oscillations. But if you don't have the right control, as I showed you, I will show you in a minute, you are going to have all sorts of uh, inter area oscillations. But this model deserves another 15 minutes and I don't have time to. So if you think about this interconnected system, it has a lot of structure like the structure that I showed before, well-established structure, structure preserving models for linearized models. Rate of change of, of energy uh, and uh, stored and um, its derivative is literally dependent on that state at the aggregate level. It depends on rate of change of control that you push, let's say, in the synchronous machine from the governor from the field excitation, but it also depends on rate of change of interacting with the neighbor or what you are sending to the neighbor. And the other one is the same way. So you look at this system and it's a very new mathematical problem that we are studying now quite, uh, quite actively. So you have two ODE models, linear models. At the interconnection level, they're fully distributed and they, have, they interact dynamically. This is probably the basis for distributed modeling even in more general dynamical systems, but we see it here, uh, we see it here in the, in the power systems big way. And what is nice, and we've been really, but, uh, you know, taking advantage of it, Rupa, Mati, and myself, is that once you are in this linear space, in the energy space, you can you have these linear interaction models, you can do provable and scalable control design, Think about what this means. This means you don't have to do linearization anymore. You don't have to decouple real reactive power anymore. It's just you do uh, these higher layer models in aggregate energy models, control interactions. This is how you design the control from the boxes, from black boxes, so that there is some protocol on controlling the interactions. And then um, you implement, still implement, you know, technology dependent physical controller inside. You still have to implement the governor, although uh, the governor is told how much reactive power, rate of change of reactive power it should send to the rest of the world. So uh, after a while, what happens is that you have unified component specifications and interactor conditions in energy space for stable and feasible operation. So this took a lot of work from nonlinear control conditions and so forth, but the, the result is very simple. If you have two components and you put them together, you want to know if there is a solution when you put them together, they are feasible. Two things you have to check. One is that components in closed loop are dissipative. And the other one is that cumulative power over time into the component that you that the component two is sending to component, component one is larger than cumulative power out of the component. That means the component is passive. So if each component is passive and we follow these rules, then, um, then you actually can check in an interactive way, in feed forward way, if these distributed actions, if everybody is doing something uh, that they want to do, but still have to obey this uh, uh, protocol, uh, if the system is going to be feasible. Imagine what we, what we were doing before here for more conventional power systems, you know, even the, um, for steady state, this is somehow you have to run power flow to understand if there is a feasible solution. People are sort of doing dynamical simulations, trying to simulate responses of um, inverters to connect it to synchronous machines to see if you con connect, uh, if you converge to some equilibrium and so forth. The thing is that it is tough, and um, uh, at least you want to have the conditions to check ahead of time. This can be used in a feed forward way. Let's say you have a neighborhood and you want to share power to, uh, and through these interactions, real power, reactive power. So the inverter based solar 
needs to supply this power to the neighbor at this rate, okay? And um, what that feasibility condition is saying is that power that is supplied, which comes out of component one to the load should stay between the limits, expected limits in um, interaction that comes from the other side of the component. So second component of the interaction variable gives that condition, you can have similar one for the power. And Rupa did, this is very painful simulation to show on that inverter based resource serving uh, constant power that actually this condition is sufficient. You're going to, to have feasible solution as long as this condition is satisfied. When you're out of condition, you have some sort of collapse. And then the interesting thing, and I just want to mention very little about uh, our energy control, which now you control these interaction variables and, and their rates so that you align them while at the same time you, you do the regulation for voltage specs and frequency specs if that's the, your own objective. And if you do that, you no longer have the, these collapses. You know, in closed loop, everybody is obeying those feasibility conditions and you have the system is feasible in closed loop in energy control. So, um, What's very important about all of these is that with linearized models, we cannot deal with um, control. We cannot say much about control during extreme events for voltage drive through, for, um, uh, for torsion oscillations, for faults. None of that actually can be modeled with linearized models. So how do you design the control to stay stable? So um, after reviewing, quite a bit of what people have done with nonlinear control in power systems. Um, we, I would like to say that there exists pot huge potential for this nonlinear control, feedback linearizing control, sliding mode control, and also energy control, but it requires these new measurements, rate of change of power, rate of change of um, frequency or acceleration. So those are, if you look at any of the control designs and I had it before, but I didn't have time to, to go through it. So I took it out. Um, you look at the state of art of nonlinear control for uh, in power systems, they all require these derivatives of power and acceleration. And the same thing in robotics for people who work in robotics to create the stable robots, you have to somehow deal with acceleration. So this is not your uh, usual um, usual PID control on, you know, in conventional state space. And the other thing, as I mentioned, insistence with IBRs and during faults, this electromagnetic energy control is very important. And so all together, in order, if you are going to deal with these intermittent resources, we actually have to have systematic energy control. So. This is, these are some older examples uh, where you had wind gusts. If you have prolonged wind the gust, you can use the energy control to control the, to absorb energy by flywheel so that uh, when there is extra <coughs> wind, the rest of the system doesn't accelerate. You can re regulate the frequency of the, of the flywheel. You can regulate the frequency of other power plants. For that, you need power electronics and so forth. Um, when you have shorter wind gusts, for example, <coughs> then you can use SVCs because they don't have that much real energy, but they can actually accumulate the right amount of electromagnetic energy to increase the critical clearing time, for example, or to help uh, the system go stay transiently stable rather than lose frequency. It, it just uh, control the electromagnetic energy so that uh, <coughs> even during the sudden wish, um, wind gust, you don't lose, uh, you don't become transient gas stable. I just want to say one sentence that uh, in power systems right now, we do analysis, we don't do control design. So this is why I, I'm emphasizing so much that there is, a, there is a huge opportunity for control design. Similarly here, for example, if you lose large generator load, 
this is what's going to happen because <coughs> the, the wind power plant doesn't have big inertia, it's going to accelerate, but fax control can absorb that extra energy, electromagnetic energy and increase critical clearing time. And the whole thing with these controllers is basically that if you fax is not absorbing that, that extra, extra energy from the generator, the, then uh, that's this case, then basically you're going to have accelerating energy and the system goes, uh, the generator goes out of synchronism. If you control with fax, if fax absorbs with electromagnetic energy, the generator can stay stable. So there is a huge opportunity here to revisit uh, what fax can do with, for transient stabilization. Uh, Three more minutes, I'm going to override this because uh, overrun, but I think it's actually quite important that to show you what we did, and this is fresh from press, uh, Rupa did it. If you take that IVR, uh, IVR um, uh, DC source, converting to AC and serving power load, uh, there are two sort of challenge problems in these microgrids. One is to serve constant power, and you can do it with two loops or PID control or energy control and so forth. And the other one is if, um, if uh, the circuit is excited by intermittent uh, solar on the DC side, and you want to see how, how the response uh, depends on, um, on control embedded. I think this is absolutely fascinating to me. If you apply conventional full state feedback to loop IBR and you want to serve constant load, you easily find a range where you have voltage collapse. And that's nothing new because of this negative incremental impedance. If you apply conventional PID because you have derivative control, you don't have voltage collapse, voltage is settled, but derivative is important. Now you have to also design your energy control very carefully uh, because if you just align power, you remember that, uh, that that interaction variable had two components, power and rate of change of reactive power. If you just align power, here we go, voltage collapse and energy, uh, these imbalances show why it is happening. Now, if you do it by aligning P at the slower pace and Q dot rate of change of reactive power at the faster pace, look how nice response it is. There is no voltage collapse or whatsoever. We are going to study this much more because it provides huge opportunities for voltage right through and so forth. The more interesting thing here is also if you have oscillatory case, in other words, you apply a persistent oscillation in, uh, on the output of, the, of your IBR and, sorry, uh, uh, persistent oscillation in your uh, load power, the power load that you want to serve is not constant, it's oscillating a little bit like you have, uh, you have uh, with intermittent resources. You typically with conventional full state feedback and we are, everybody is worried about things. We have these things, we have tons of papers, you know, but they're prim primarily in frequency domain saying if you have intermittent resources, look, you're going to have some oscillations in, in the internal states of the inverters and output voltage, et cetera. And it's easy to explain. This is, we are still studying, but it's actually mind twisting that those oscillations primarily happen because of reactive power imbalances, rate of change of reactive power imbalances. Now, if you do um, the just align real power and you have persistent oscillation in power of the output, you still have these oscillations. We are seeing these oscillations left and right, but we really don't understand them in terms of energy dynamics. This is why I wanted to talk about this. And um, you have to tune your controls right even in the energy space, but if you tune it right and you align both phi and Q dot, you get beautiful, almost no oscillations at the output in voltage that is you know the quality of power that you serve to the load and the explanations here why is that happening so to close uh, I went very fast but um, 
it's probably worthwhile thinking about these multi-layered functional specifications of black boxes rather than really getting lost into and requiring that something becomes white box. It's never going to be, become uh, white box, it's black box. And um, then we could have sort of general structure-based simple paradigm in which you have whatever hierarchy you have, these are multiple administrative entities, but they all, um, you know, we are basically moving from balancing authorities to what we call nested intelligent balancing authority. You have many, many other entities, can be portfolio of wind and storage, can be one area with its own hydro and so forth, many different combinations. Um, and the general idea is really to rethink physical dynamics in terms of interaction variables, who is affecting whom and how we control this thing. And um, the last thing is that that requires, and I've been talking about this since I think 2010, the first time I talked at NERC and FERC about it, is that um, we really need uh, dynamic standards and protocols. And now the time has come that I think we cannot even integrate these intermittent resources with the, some dynamic specifications for interfaces. And to do that, three things, not that hard at all. We have to, instead of just thinking that we have just balancing authorities, we have a lot of intelligent balancing authorities interacting. And the second thing is we have SCADA at the bulk power system, let it be the way it is, PJM is the way it is, but that SCADA needs to for, support interactions with lower layers, SCADAs like DERMs and so forth through these interaction variables. People are talking about archite these architectures, but they actually, nobody that I know of has actually defined what should be the minimal information that I'm proposing here from first principles so that if that information is changed, the protocol is followed, uh, for feasibility, et cetera, and control is designed right. So you align these interactions, the, um, the system will work well. And uh, the basic information when it's all said and done is in terms of energy power and rate of change of power, reactive power. Uh, and uh, I, I really like this because AGC is my absolute favorite. I think my old advisor used to say that is uh, one of the most ingenious man-made feedback control thing. It's so simple, just respond to the net imbalance. And if every utility does that, they, you know, the system stays together. What we are talking about here is really generalizing ACE, but having to do it so that we recognize that, uh, that it's not just for linearized model, you have to capture different time uh, scales and uh, also the interdependence between elect electromechanical and magnetic and whatever other energy. So I stop here, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Go ahead and stop the recording and then we'll uh, take questions. So um, there were,